hopefully everybody had a good lunch. As long as they don't dim the lights, I guess we might hang in there a little bit. But uh, I seem to get the right after lunch crowd. <laughs> that slot. That's a... <coughs> well, anyway, uh, earlier we talked about what the medical physicist does uh, to evaluate the, the CT scanners and uh, what they have to do to evaluate performance and to adhere to regulatory requirements and, uh, and uh, accreditation standards. Uh, now I'm going to go in with what uh, the, the ongoing quality control uh, program is uh, and recommendations of these, uh, these bodies as well. Again, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Doug and Chad for uh, contributing uh, some to this uh, and helping over, over the years. Uh, some really good uh, references uh, are on the website for the ACR, the CT accreditation program requirements, uh, phantom testing instructions, those are there. That gives a list of how, uh, how to do these tests and uh, also <clears throat> what the criteria are. So you can uh, get those uh, free uh, on the, online. Uh, the medical physics standard for performing computer uh, tomography includes what the physicist should do and also uh, the quality control program that's recommended under that program. And then, of course, there's uh, guidance for, uh, for actually for the protocols for performing different studies are on there, the practice guidelines for pediatric tomography as well as all of the different organ systems. Uh, there's also guidance for imaging the pregnant or potentially pregnant uh, patient. Uh, so there's guidelines there. Uh, diagnostic reference levels, uh, that publication is in there. Uh, a lot of stuff was taken from um, NCRP 172 uh, to help that, as well as the accreditation program. Uh, so you can get this stuff uh, on the website. Uh, so that a lot of that came from that, since I do a lot of ACR accreditation. Now, one of the reasons why we have to do quality control is that uh, we have either regulatory requirements uh, for us to do that, or the accreditation programs have uh, standards that ask us to do that. Uh, right now we have the four that are approved for CMS uh, and that seems to be the standard that everybody else is adopting uh, and all of them have require some kind of QC be performed um, and IAC and the ACR have specific requirements and how what, what needs to be done and they have some documentation requirements. Uh, RAD site doesn't have any specific QC requirements, but they do require it. Uh, the Joint Commission, actually, in their uh, recently uh, published standards, actually, it's almost a year now, hard to believe, <laughs> uh, that the organi organization just needs to identify what is our quality control program and what are our maintenance activities to maintain quality um, <clears throat> in our CT imaging facility, uh, as well as the other advanced modalities, but we're just talking about CT. And then the organization also is required to document uh, how often these activities need to be uh, conducted. Uh, the AEC, again, you can download their standards from their website and that uh, gives you an idea of what needs to be done and here's just a summary of some of that. Uh, they have some daily QC requirements uh, and it needs to be appropriate to the scanner. That's why IEC is, is a little broader in what kind of equipment that they uh, they credit, and so therefore they, they want you to adopt a QC program that's appropriate to the, the type of scanner you have, because there's a lot of things you can't do on some of these cone beam CT units that um, you can on uh, typical clinical CT scanners. Uh, but they do want you to look at the water number, because the CT number for water is really essential in, um, in the operation and uh, the use of diagnostic CT. Uh, and then some other reference materials as well. Um, you want to look at image noise so that we can see that, the, that our noise isn't too high because as uh, Keith was talking about earlier, we really want a good CNR, contrast and noise ratio. Uh, and so uh, evaluating that noise and looking at stability in your CT numbers helps you to evaluate that in an ongoing way. And then in the annual uh, survey, then you can look at CNR a little more deeply or as uh, indications come up. Uh, artifact assessment uh, is part of the daily QC, 
and then uh, the proper function of any uh, audio and visual and patient safety equipment is also uh, needed just to make sure that you can see your patient while you're scanning them and be able to communicate with them uh, to keep them from moving or in case there's some issues so they don't get injured uh, during the scan. <clears throat> and then there are other periodic requirements, again, appropriate to the scanner. Uh, uh, you want to include spatial resolution, high and low contrast objects, image uniformity, slice thickness, alignment light accuracy, image display and storage device, all those things that we talked about when we were going through the physics um, CT survey that we did. And error calibration, if the uh, unit requires that you do that on a daily, a daily basis or more often, then uh, you need to do that as well. Uh, they also identify that you need to set up action limits uh, in response to the QC. Uh, the, and uh, therefore, they want the qualified medical physicist to evaluate the QC program on an annual basis to make sure that the criteria have been met in this ongoing uh, process. Uh, you also want it, they want the QMP to evaluate, is this QC program effective? Uh, is it sensitive enough to detect any problems? You know, you can have really broad um, control limits and you're doing it every day, but it's not really picking up any issues. So you want to make sure you can evaluate it, that it's somewhat effective. Uh, and you can be, you can make your, uh, your values, your control values tighter than uh, what, what they, uh, published in their manual, so. Uh, so evaluate the scanner, see what would be, be work best for that ongoing QC program so you can get uh, the optimal performance out of that. So uh, you can get optimal images uh, for your radiologists to uh, review. <clears throat> and if there are any hardware changes or major service activities, uh, you need to make sure that QC is evaluated before you move on and start doing uh, patients. And so therefore, if QC seems to be tight after a change and a service upgrade or something like that, then it might be fine to just continue to uh, uh, perform without any further uh, intervention. But it's uh, best that uh, the quality qualified medical physicists be contacted to see if there is a need for any uh, more comprehensive evaluation, uh, an equipment evaluation, such as after a tube change. There may be a need to uh, make sure that the the tube uh, is giving the same output and therefore your CTDI uh, information is still valid because uh, there are differences in outputs if, uh, from different manufacturers that can affect that. Uh, so the ACR has their QC manual that outlines uh, all of the QC that needs to be done by the various different team members, uh, has the radiologist, the, the RT that's there, the medical physicist. We went through the medical physicist earlier. Um, now we'll talk more about the RT and the radiologists, what uh, their responsibilities are. And uh, the HR, it is an organization of, of radiologists. Uh, they are really the, they're the lead interpreting uh, member of the team. They're, they're actually reading diagnostic studies that uh, they need to be valid. So they need to make sure that there's a program that's effective that's uh, guaranteeing that they're uh, um, that their images are clinically relevant and that they're minimizing um, artifacts and other things that can interfere with clinical interpretation. So the supervising radiologist uh, is responsible overall uh, to see that there is an optimization of, of dose and image quality. Um, and they do that by putting together a team because they're really, they're really quite busy in, in interpreting the images. There's quite a lot of information that's coming their way uh, and so they really need the other team members uh, to contribute to this. So to bring the technologists and the quali uh, qualified medical physicists together uh, and make sure that the protocol settings are, are, are valid. They need to validate those, that the, the doses within the established uh, <clears throat> reference levels that we have for the facility uh, and that the image quality is acceptable. And then we also are responsible for working together on this team to, to establish these thresholds. So if we could cry, if our dose is too high, uh, then we can re-examine the protocol based on a discussion between all of the uh, stakeholders involved in this team. Uh, the, the radiologist also is charged with overseeing uh, 
that patient safety is, is accounted for in the whole process, that they were reducing the risk uh, from, from the dose from getting this study. Uh, and so they want to make sure that they're constantly involved in this. And so therefore, they need to establish some type of review process. Uh, some people call it the CT Dose Monitoring Committee uh, or just general dose monitoring committee if it includes other modalities. Um, and so they need to make sure that the pro protocols aren't being changed or reviewing them to make sure that there is, if there is a need to change them, that there is a valid uh, process in order to change that and that somebody's not just uh, changing them without any uh, indication and without authority. And so therefore, uh, this team needs to get together with the supervising technologist as well as the medical physicist to see that this is done efficiently. <coughs> also, they should establish a policy to make sure that these dose estimates uh, interface, that means conveying the, the information uh, to, the, to the PACs and uh, making it available uh, for future reference, that that's not disabled. Uh, so that the dose is retrievable in some form. So it is recommended that they do that for all of the different exams that are available. Now, part of this, in order to be effective, you have to have a, a, a participate, participating uh, team that's going in there that's well-trained and has the time to conduct an effective QC program. Uh, so they need to provide the technologists with the adequate training. So you gotta make sure that not only are they just an RT, but they have adequate uh, training in CT specific modalities, and that it's, they're familiar with all of the dose parameters and what they mean, and what are the different uh, effects uh, of the protocol uh, parameters that are there, that will, how that will affect dose and how it'll affect image quality. So that's now become more of a, uh, uh, a requirement to get these uh, the technologists to make sure that they're current with that type of uh, education uh, so that it's focusing on patient safety. So there's more uh, patient safety specific to CT that's starting to be uh, uh, a part of this whole team effort. So the, the radiologist really is supposed to be overseeing that this is completed because he is a, the essential leader of the team. And then, of course, you need to have the technologists put together the, uh, the procedures manual uh, along with the physicists and then make sure that's maintained and that it's being followed. And that <coughs> excuse me. And make sure there's time for them to perform these tests, to record it, uh, to make sure that they have time to evaluate it. Because I, I, I've been in to some places and they have their QC is recorded and I'll look at it and I see that they failed. I said, did, did you notice that you were out of spec, they said, yeah, but it was okay, and we just kept moving on. And it's like, no, you really need to address this. It's like, take a look at it. Is it clinically relevant? Talk to the radiologist that's gonna be uh, reviewing this. You need to make sure that if there is uh, a QC parameter that's outside of the control limits, that there is corrective action that's uh, applicable to, uh, to the parameter you're looking at. Uh, and it really needs to be discussion with the, the radiologist. Excuse me. Now, uh, the radiologists and the technologists have a really vital role. Uh, they need to review day to day any image quality programs or problems that they see. The radiologist should say, I see some rings in my clinical images, or I see this artifact. They need to relay that to the, the technologist and let them know so they can look at their QC and follow up on that. So there is a responsibility on the, the, the radiologist to, to, to communicate with the uh, technologist as well as the um, medical physicist. Um, and then when you evaluate these artifacts or these problems that they're seeing, do we need to continue acquiring uh, clinical images or do we need to have corrective action before we proceed? So that discussion needs to happen. <coughs> And then, of course, initial assessment when you're setting up your protocols, you need to make sure that you have uh, sufficient image quality and that uh, the QC program is set up and that it is being maintained. The radiologist should be aware, hey, I shouldn't come in after a year and see that, uh, that there were outliers on the QC. The radiologist should periodically look at it as well to make sure he's aware of any things that might be out as well. 
course, the medical physicist and the, the RT also have to have a, an important relationship in an ongoing way. Uh, the RT and, uh, is there day to day in the field, seeing, uh, using the scanner every day. Uh, they know what's going on, how it operates, it's little nuances uh, that are associated with it, what they have to do. And so they can document that kind of stuff as part of the QC program. Uh, so the physicist has to work with the RT to establish the quality control program, and that may be just going through and training them on how to implement the ACR's program or the uh, IAC's program or whatever program that uh, they agree to come up with that pertains to the standards or that's applicable to the clinical site. Uh, and so not only do they establish it, but then they have to make sure that they're working together to make sure that it's properly executed. And so we have, uh, our sites will send us copies of their QC on a quarterly basis uh, just to make sure that we can see things more than once a year that uh, they're not outside of the control limits. Uh, also, uh, like I said, when we go in and train them, we will actually set up the protocol that's sufficient to uh, obtain a, a successful QC program. Uh, and what on each scanner, because if they have different manufacturers who are scan, uh, uh, CTs that are out there, you may have to have different protocols. As you know, when Keith was talking earlier, he was talking about how one scanner, you can get the same uh, CNR with different masses and you get the same dose because there, there's different geometries, there's different filters involved, there's different spectrum that come out of the s scanners. Uh, so just because the uh, protocol looks the same, that, that doesn't mean that you're going to get images uh, that are going to be the same. So the, as the uh, medical physicist, we need to work with the CT to establish the protocol that would be acceptable for the QC program. And then, of course, we're a resource that if there are any problems, if QC does go out, they, we, they can call us and let us know, and we can give them guidance on uh, what do they need to do. They need to get service in here and make a correction give them guidance, like, you know, maybe it's just run some more air cows or do a full calibration. Maybe that will take care of things uh, and we'll take a look at that. So when any issues that come up, then we should be available. So in the uh, ACR manual, there's a technologist set, uh, section and it outlines all the tests that are required for their QC program. It's a cookbook style It really laid out really easily to follow that. And there are forms that are uh, available there as well. And this is a summary of what those uh, tests are. You do, uh, it's really pretty simple. Uh, we really want to make it easy because an effective QC program, you want to do tests that are going to be effective, uh, that they're not going to be overly burdensome so that they don't do them. Uh, so you want to make it simple and effective. So uh, these were what uh, the committee came up with that was really uh, deemed to be effective and simple. Uh, it's taking the water CT number every day uh, and looking at the standard deviation. So you're getting a rough estimate of CNR by, by doing that. It takes about five minutes. Artifact evaluation is really big because that's when you can see whether or not your detectors are going out, that kind of thing. And if you see it and you don't do anything about it, then now that can affect the clinical images that are, you're going to get the rest of the day. You want to catch those before it affects the clinical imaging environment. Uh, so that's done daily as well. Uh, one of the things that we do with the, recommend with that is to alternate between axial and um, helical in evaluating the, the artifacts uh, because there are certain artifacts that are specific to helical. And if you do all your QC in axial, then you won't catch those. Uh, so it's good to alternate those. Uh, and then on a monthly basis, there's the visual checklist uh, that you go through. That uh, it's, a, it's an ACR thing, so uh, we have a visual checklist. Uh, wet, I just haven't seen a wet laser printer in many, 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 many years. So uh, if you have one, uh, then they, and it's used for primary uh, interpretation, uh, then there needs to be a QC program that uh, uh, is done for that. Uh, but there are some dry laser printers out there, and that needs to be done monthly if it's used for primary interpretation. So that means if they print images on that and a doctor gives a diagnosis, that's primary interpretation. If it's just like, hey, yeah, that looks like it's positioned right, that kind of thing, it's, uh, and then they read it later on a review workstation, then that would not be primary. Uh, and then, of course, there's display monitor uh, quality control. 
Uh, that's where the CT tech is sitting, uh, where they're operating, and then they see the images that they acquire pop up, and so that uh, there is some QC uh, required monthly for that. So what phantom uh, can you use for that? Uh, most of the time, the, the manufacturers provide all of their scanners with a, a water-filled cylindrical phantom uh, that has different test objects in it. They're all different, so uh, some of them you can do all of the tests you want uh, for them, but uh, some of them they, you might just be able to do water. Uh, that's all it is, is a water phantom. But the ACR phantom can be used for that as well, or any of the other phantoms. This just shows all of the other different phantoms. We have the, the ACR, the CAT fan, the AEPM, Phantom, Siemens, Philips, and GE. Those are the main ones that are on there. Uh, and so you can see that they're all a little bit different, but uh, you can use them. Uh, they're, they're convenient. They already have them, so let's use them. And uh, some of the alternative protocols that uh, might be available is to use the manufacturer's method to do it. And it's okay to do that uh, instead of just adopting the, um, <clears throat> the ACR's method. Uh, but if you do it, the physicist needs to be involved and needs to sign off on it, needs to approve that it is, and needs to verify that it's acceptable to do that. So if there are automated QC uh, that's performed on the phantom, the medical physicist should evaluate uh, that that's a valid QC program. So they need to run the automated and then do a manual and make sure that everything uh, is acceptable with using both methods. And then you need to document that in writing that it is acceptable. <clears throat> the thing is, is that if you have automated QC, they don't have an artifact check on their little automated printout that they have. So you'll have to document that you're uh, evaluating it for uh, artifacts. So there needs to be some other form of documenting that if, they're, if you're using those automated things. And this is an example, the Siemens Phantom. Uh, and you just uh, you zero it there in the middle and then it moves and acquires all of the data uh, automatically, uh, goes to minus 80 to the water phantom, uh, and then it, uh, it runs at the uh, processing of all the data, and then you get a, a printout, a table of all of the uh, results of that. So what are the uh, recommended uh, QC? The water CT number and st standard deviation, artifact of value valuation, the visual checklist, um, you may need to add some additional QC for certain scanners because if it's got additional um, applications in the clinic, you might want to evaluate some of these other properties and so that would be something that is worked out with the imaging team of the, um, the uh, radiologist and the QMP and uh, the technologist. Now who's, who's going to run the QC, the ongoing program? Uh, it's really best if you have the same person doing it, so you're minimizing some of the variation that may come, but that's not always possible to do that, uh, but at least to try to identify for that scanner. Um, but, but that way they're knowledgeable, they're familiar with how things work, they can, they can identify the outliers a lot quickly than somebody who's new. They're just, they're just trying to figure out how do I do this, and uh, so then they, they get it and document it. And that's usually what happens when I see something that's out. It's like, well, you know, Joe was doing it that day, and he usually doesn't do it, and <laughs> we just didn't look at it. Um, but you'd have better uh, consistency and uh, sensitivity to any issues that would come up. Uh, but no matter what, it should be done as it's required. You need to do daily QC, particularly the artifact evaluation, just to make sure that uh, we're not scanning people with uh, subsequent art artifacts. And then anybody who's doing it needs to be properly trained. They need to allow the time for the person to train it. Now, when we go there and, it's, and, and they're new to QC, or if there's new people, we, uh, uh, we actually run the QC when we're there for the annual. We do it ourselves because we kind of just like to check to make sure it's really happening, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and then we go through it with them. And we train uh, QC that people that haven't been used to doing it. Uh, so we go through that and actually we actually can award some credit hours for that as well. Uh, that kind of helps to keep them around because the big thing is when the physicist shows up, they all want to go, oh, I can go, right? <laughs> it's like, no, I need you here. So I make sure I'm testing this, how you use it, that kind of thing. 
Uh, so part of the requirements for uh, quality control is to have a notebook that has all of the quality control policies and procedures that have been established and approved by the medical physicist in conjunction with the rest of the team. Uh, and they need to have the data forms uh, that are being used or the method that you're going to do it. It needs to be included in there. And there needs to be an area for the comments and communication saying, okay, what was the corrective actions that were taken if there were some findings that came out? Uh, or if there's a change in protocols, what was the reason for the change in the protocols? Uh, it's recommended the service engineer also document when he does certain or her, she does things to the scanner uh, so that you can see if there's a change in the QC, oh, you know what, uh, the service engineer was just in here and that's why everything's different, you know, and um, maybe he forgot to recalibrate before he left and that's a, actually more common than you would think. Um, <clears throat> but fortunately, that's something that the site can do rather easily and quickly. Uh, and the data needs to be reviewed at least annually by the QMP. Uh, it's also recommended uh, that the physician review this as well, the notebook. Um, all right, so here's some of the tests. Uh, before you the technologist is going to be doing the QC that's due, uh, they need to warm up the scanner for the manufacturer's recommendations. A lot of times, you know, the first you come in first thing morning, the scanner's been sitting down all, all night. So it needs to be warmed up so that it's conditioned so that you're not getting artifacts that are due to the fact that it's a cold tube um, and the electronics are just been sitting around. So you want to just make sure that uh, that's done. And then the cali the, most of them have these air calibration procedures that they require to be done daily before they go. Uh, and so they need to be done. And then they go in and position the phantom. A lot of them, if they don't have routine um, cases throughout the night, will actually position the phantom on the night before, and so it's ready for whatever technologist is in there. Uh, so that, that kind of helps speed things up. Um, but if, uh, if you have the manufacturers there, there are holders that, that hold it in place. You just got to make sure that's secure, it's on there, and then you put it in the correct position uh, for it to uh, obtain the correct data for evaluation. Uh, the ACR phantom, uh, you actually put on the table. Uh, you can actually put it just on the table and, and kind of support it with some towels or sponges or things like that or tape. Or, but uh, it's really good if you get the, if you get the uh, holder that, that you can buy separately with it. That helps the position a lot easier if you can do that. And then use the alignment lights to make sure that you're properly positioned. Because uh, as I said, if you're angled and such, uh, it can induce artifacts into the image that you get. So uh, you scan the phantom and use the protocols uh, that they recommend for the manufacturer. Uh, for the ACR, you use adult head or adult body, but whatever you use, you need to use it the same protocol. Uh, and then, we're, like I said, we recommend that uh, we do both helical and axial uh, scans. Uh, and instead of doing both every day, you can alternate it. And place the uh, region of interest and get the water number. The, the, you either have a water-filled phantom, and so it's definitely water. But I will tell you this, old phantoms <laughs> that still have water in them, especially if they had tap water in them, their density changes over time due to the uh, things that grow in it and such. And so the CT number can drift, and it's not a calibration issue. It's due to the, the biological material that's inside. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that needs to be cleaned periodically. Uh, but anyway, but you need to do it in the same location, so obtain those images and, and keep it consistent so that the uh, QC is, is consistent. You're trying to minimize as many variables as possible so you can identify outliers and therefore possibly identify um, the cause. And then we're multi-sliced. You want to try, try to take something in the middle where it has the least amount of artifact contribution to it. <clears throat> of course, for the action limits, you use the manufacturer's uh, phantom. You will use their limits as well. Uh, for the ACR, it's uh, plus or minus five uh, CT units. Uh, and, and so you want to make sure you're within that. Um, <coughs> as far as the noise, there are no real limits. So usually as the physicist will look at it, do some uh, averages and things like that and just try to keep it within and establish our own limits based on the scanner and our experience with that. 
Uh, but that's, that's how we do it. We set it up with the uh, site when we're there for our survey. Um, <clears throat> if there are anything that goes out of limits, then you need to, as I said, either recalibrate it and repeat the, ex the uh, QC procedure to see if it comes back in limits, or if it's something that's significant, you need to contact uh, service um, for corrective action. If you keep trying to fix it and your CT numbers are out three days in a row, that means we have a, might have a bigger problem, and so get service in there. So for artifact evaluation, uh, you need to position the phantom and use the scan parameters that were set up um, and do an axial scan, and these are just some examples of a technique that might be used, and use the maximum number of slices possible. Uh, and the thing is, do you want to check every data channel for 320 of them? Um, that's something some people do. Uh, you can't go through it. That's a lot of slices to go through. Um, I've done it on several occasions, and uh, it's really easy to get kind of, I don't think this is necessary kind of mentality if you do that many slices. Uh, because you don't really see anything. You usually see it somewhere else uh, rather than that. But, but you can really scroll through them rather quickly uh, and things will jump out if you're used to seeing these images. Uh, so it's really good to look at it because then you can pick up these subtle uh, changes that before they affect the uh, clinical images. And then of course you do your helical technique uh, and you really try to get an effective mass of about the same way with your helical. And by effective mass, that's just adjusting the mass by the pitch. And so you're really getting the same uh, CNR type thing. Uh, <clears throat> and so you want to look at uh, two and a half millimeter images and look and then go through there and you see if you have any artifacts. Uh, now you do this visually, so you want to make sure that the image is windowed and leveled uh, so that you can see it uh, properly. Um, you want to look for rings or streaks or lines. If, you see, if the technologist sees anything, they need to record what they saw on, on the QC form. <coughs> now it is, uh, the eye is sensitive to changes. So like I said, when you rapidly go through that, you really, they do jump out at you. It's really uh, incredible how that happens. Uh, when you're used to seeing uniform and then all of a sudden you'll see an artifact pop. Sometimes you've already passed it, but you'll come back and, and you'll notice it. Um, like I said, uh, corrective action is, is warranted if you think it's cl clinical. If it's subclinical, keep an eye on it, talk to the radiologist, that kind of thing. Rerun the air calibrations that might fix it. Um, if they're still present, then just have that, dis the tech needs to have the discussion with the radiologist to see, is this clinically relevant? Do I need to, you know, stop using it or only use it for certain type of uh, procedures? Uh, and if it is de deemed that there is corrective action warranted, you need to, they need to schedule service and have it corrected. So this is an example of uh, some streaks that you might be able to see in there and some rings that are common. Uh, <coughs> streaks come from, uh, I think I talked a little bit about earlier, there can be stuff on the table and um, come from contrast media and things like that. The rings come from imbalance detectors. Could be calibration, it could be that the detectors are, um, are drifting and uh, you need to be replaced, that kind of thing. Uh, here is a failure of detector heater elements that gave this uh, artifact that came out. And so uh, we got some ghosting uh, kind of artifacts in adjacent areas there. So. And here is some more uh, that shows uh, just various artifacts that can show up on this. And you just need to go through that and say, is this, you know, that one on the bottom, you just want to say that doesn't belong there. That could be show up on clinical. So you want to recalibrate things and see that could be a, a detector kind of problem. And then uh, on a monthly basis or weekly, if you want, uh, they want to get a larger phantom uh, so you can evaluate the artifacts uh, in a larger field of view. And so this is an example of some of those streaks and such that you might see. And so you would window and level to uh, appropriate look at them, uh, but then uh, you have a discussion with a radiologist, so is this really significant? So you want to get it into a window and level that would be used in a clinical uh, interpretation range. So here's just a, a picture of a larger phantom that's on there. Some of these are kind of heavy, uh, so it's, it's kind of a risk to that uh, if they're a small technologist that's going to be picking them up. 
just be uh, make sure that they're capable of doing it. But uh, um, if you're only doing it periodically, you can get somebody who can handle it or, or see the physicist can do it or the service engineer can look at it when he comes in a little more frequently. Okay. Oh, there we go. <coughs> Here's uh, just going through a, uh, <coughs> a helical image here, and you can see that they're just kind of popped out a little bit, a little ring artifact. See right there? It comes in. And so that's kind of what you look at uh, when you're looking at these images, and then you can uh, evaluate uh, whether or not this is a detector kind of problem or if it's a phantom-induced problem. Okay. And there it goes. When we do helically, you can see that that ring moved from slice to slice. So that's showing that the detector as it moves, it's being changed as it goes around. So you have a heli an axial one gives you a ring, and then as you go around, you get the helical. So you can see that that's a detector. So this is the, uh, the form that the ACR uh, recommends for documenting uh, the, the daily QC. Uh, and you can see it alternates between the axial and the helical. Um, is it time? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's okay. I don't understand time, so <laughs> I need those little reminders. So, um, but anyway. Um, so there, there's a way to document everything. You document the date it was done, uh, what was the CT number that you got, um, did it pass the, the, li the limit, was it acceptable, was it, was it within limits, uh, and then document on the notes what if you saw artifacts. And if you saw artifacts, what were they, what did you do, did you relay it to the uh, radiologist, did you relay it to the uh, quality, qualified medical physicist, and then you document there that uh, who did it, uh, and then the physicist would review this uh, on a periodic basis and sign it on the bottom. Uh, another thing is, uh, as we said, what's due is the laser printer QC is uh, required, uh, and basically uh, dry lasers, you know, the, the justification for that has always been, these are automatically calibrated. Uh, if, you do, if you're automatically calibrated, why do we need to do QC? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, so why is it even necessary? Yeah, because it has it's calibrating, but it has an instrument in there that's calibrating it. And if that goes off of calibration, if it's not working, then then you ignore it. You won't see it until you use it. Um, so there was a Kodak 8700 laser printer. It was performed on schedule. QC was not performed, and then they got complaints that there was a problem with the, the films that were printed. And it turned out that uh, the sensitometry curve was different than when it was set up, and that was due to a drift on the uh, internal uh, sensitometer. <clears throat> so therefore, if, you're, if you are printing films that are used for primary interpretation, then the monthly QC is, uh, is recommended. Uh, what that entails is doing a visual analysis of the SMPT pattern and look for those 5% and 95% uh, patches that are in uh, that phantom. Uh, and then uh, you can do quantitative analysis. You take uh, your densitometer and you read the patches of 0%, 10%, 40%, 90%, those squares that are on there, and plot those values and make sure they don't deviate uh, from month to month from the plus or minus 15. So this is the SMPT pattern, and there are the 5% and the 95% patches. You want to say, can, I, can everybody see those in there, the, the gray patches inside the, the black and the white? Uh, so there, there's a contrast of just 5% from the low end to, and the high end. And so you want to make sure you see that. Uh, and so that's just a qualitative type uh, evaluation. And then here are uh, the other four patches that you take uh, your densitometer and take some density readings, and then you can plot it. On, uh, on a graph like this here, uh, set up, uh, go month to month, and then document any uh, issues that you come across as you're doing that. Also, uh, acquisition display monitors. Um, it, this is the acquisition. It's not the review workstation that is used for final interpretation. Uh, that's been deemed to be outside the realm of this, and that, uh, that should be handled separately. Uh, and so. Uh, 
Um, hopefully there'll be uh, gui more guidance for that. Right now it is required for mammography. Uh, it is not required for other modalities at this time. Um, and so it is recommended. And, and actually, we, we actually do that for a lot of facilities. We, we actually help them set it up because there are a lot of automatic QC programs that can take care of these things. And then some technologists can review to make sure there aren't artifacts or, or pixels missing. And usually a radiologist, if they are looking at their monitors uh, and they see missing pixels or artifacts on there, they're going to complain, I just spent $30,000 on this thing. It's got a missing pixel, you know? It's like, somebody come in here and fix it okay. or replace it. Spend another 30. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so they should look at that. So they need to examine the pattern and make sure that they can see it, that they can distinguish it from the background that it's in there, and then uh, take care of that. Um, and then, of course, as I said, it's uh, the ACR has uh, the, va the visual checklist. And this is really things that normally you would just take for granted, that you're operating the system, you're using all of these uh, mechanisms on your scanner, and you, you may take it for granted. And you really are making these mental notes that, oh, you know, there's a problem here. I'll, I'll fix it later. Well, it doesn't get fixed later. So this is a way to just say at least once a month, somebody's going to document it. And so that way they can say, okay, I see you documented that there was a problem here, so let's... Where's, what's your corrective action, that type of thing. So the things that are recommended to be included on there is the table height indicator. Is that functioning? You know, is that going up properly? You know, if you want to use the table height indicator uh, to position to the ISIS center, uh, you know, there is a problem if your table is not positioned right. The dose of the patient is dependent on the location of that um, patient, whether up and down. So if you're not reproducing that location, uh, then you can uh, affect the dose to the patient. Because if the patient is down too low, then they're now close to uh, the tube uh, when it's down on the bottom. So you want to, uh, they should try to, to get the patient to be centered uh, when they're doing that. And for reproducibility uh, reasons or to look at it when uh, you're evaluating the images, make sure that the height indicator is functioning accurately. The table position indicator, if I move it, 20 centimeters, is it truly moving 20 centimeters? Or if that's off, then if you're doing a biopsy, then you might be off when you kind of go in there. Uh, the angular angulation indicator, uh, if they do studies uh, where they're angling the, the gantry, is that angle indication accurate? Uh, so they need to kind of keep an eye on that. Is it displaying uh, on the monthly uh, visual check? It's really, is this thing really showing me that it's working? Or do I need the service come in here and uh, fix the display, model, uh, display of the, the digital output? Uh, the laser localizing functioning. Does when I hit the light, does it come on? Are they lined up? I mean, I, don't, I, I go into so many, and I have this side, the laser's here, and this side, the laser's here. And I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't right. And they go, well, this side's right. This one's not. We ignore this. I said, what? That's, you know, and I go, well, as long as they know that, I guess that's, that's OK. But it's, it's really, really universal through this manufacturer that they kind of focus on one side. Uh, but, and it's usually on. Uh, but, you, but those are the kind of things you want to look at. Is my laser lighter working? Um, that kind of thing. Or, or if I hit it, no light comes on. You want to get it fixed, and so you would document that. Uh, and then you want to look at, you know, uh, it's not becoming as much of an issue as it used to be. I used to walk in and when I'd go into a scanner to go get a fan, I might have to step over high voltage cables and things like that. Now they're really putting them under the floor. They're not as uh, in the way as they used to be. But you want to look at that because this is high voltage cables. <laughs> so if you start seeing wear on that, kind of indicate that, hey, you know, uh, maybe the service engineer needs to look at these cables and uh, try to fix this potential electrical hazard. Uh, make sure that's there. And then the table, is it moving smoothly? Or is uh, all that contrast media that I haven't been cleaning up, gumming it up and stalling it as it moves along? And so they need to be aware of that and document that, that that's not uh, moving. When the x-ray is on, does it indicate the x-ray is on? You know, that, does that light come on? Or is there a message that comes on that says that the, uh, the x-ray is on? So that's something, you know, at least once a month they should document. Yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, so they can do that. 
Um, the exposure switch, if you, you know, if you hit the switch, does it, it energize the, the tube and, and you get an exposure out of that or is there some kind of a problem with it? Uh, is there a problem if I try to abort? Uh, does it not abort? That kind of thing. Um, so document those type of things. Uh, the display window, window, and level. Um, if you're doing all that, uh, does, is that getting sticky because somebody dropped a Coke and it's all kind of uh, gooey and it's going to jam up so it needs to be clean? Or is it now just so old that it's no longer functioning? Uh, and so things like that need to be documented. Uh, some places have door interlocks that, you know, that they want to prevent uh, um, an exposure if somebody walks in. Uh, frankly, I think the exposure of that person <laughs> is worth it for them just walking in blindly anyway, uh, than having to repeat it on a, pa on a patient. So I really don't recommend interlocks uh, on doors for, for CT because you have to repeat. Uh, you know, if somebody just put in uh, contrast media and they're acquiring a, a run and then all of a sudden the machine shuts down, you know, now you got contrast overload as well. Um, so. Um, but anyway, but that's one of the things. If you do have interlocks, do they work? Uh, are all the warning labels present? Does the intercom system work? Are the, is everything posted properly? Do we have all the warning signs like, hey, don't walk into this room. This is an x-ray room, that kind of thing. <laughs> and then uh, service, if they're coming in, this is really probably one of my biggest pet peeves, is that I come and say, can I look at the service records? And I said, uh, he, Joe's going to send them to me. He, he, you know, he was here three months ago. I, was having, I said, can, can you please have him send them to me? I want to see where things are. Uh, they really should be present. I mean, that's really uh, required to be there, especially when there's corrective action. How else can you document that corrective action was actually performed unless you have a report that it was done? So this is an example of the ACR form that's there. And uh, what we came up with is that we, uh, we actually modified the form somewhat and put that all on one um, form so that they don't have to have all those forms. So for a lot of our clients, they use this. They can keep it and once a month. They just fill out this form. Uh, and so they can do the visual checklist. They can do their artifact QC and CT numbers, their monthly monitor, uh, and even their monthly large artifact check and it has all of the criteria on there. So we uh, provide that to them. Uh, and then this is the CT quality control guidance document that we come up with when we were first setting up the QC program. This is their direction. This is what you need to do. Because I used to go in there, we'd set it up, we go, and then next year we come in and they go, you never went through that with me. <laughs> yes, we did. I said, here's the protocol. You know, it's right here. We actually go in there, uh, and we used to be able to get in more, but now they lock the protocols, so it's, we have to get somebody to let us in to develop protocols. Uh, but we established a protocol that's just for QC to do this. So, so it's automatic. We really want to make it simple so that it's done. So this gives them all the directions on what they need to do to complete their QC. Uh, the big thing is, is if you have a quality control pr program, it, must, it needs to be active, not passive. That means if there is a problem, they need to be corrected. There needs to be documentation. There needs to be participation from the radiologists uh, so they know what's going on in their program. If there's a problem, they need to analyze it immediately. It needs to be logged. It needs to be documented. Um, and then, like I said, get that team together and decide. Talk to the field service engineer. We need this corrected before we can continue or not. Um, so what is, uh, there is quality management. Uh, Quality, um, qualified medical physicist oversight. Uh, we should be involved more. We need to be visible and accessible. We are. I mean, my phone goes off all the time. I really am surprised it hasn't been going off this weekend. But um, they really call us and we answer. <laughs> That's one thing that we do. We do answer. Um, or it's converted to someone who will answer. That's one of the things you want to have them have us accessible so that if there are problems, they have a qualified medical physicist that uh, will give them guidance and how they should correct it. Uh, the data that we have, the data in the QC needs, should be available to the field service engineer that comes in. Uh, so they can say, so what are you talking about? What numbers did you get? What protocol did you use? And then they could evaluate that so that they can approach it uh, to help resolve it. 
And as I said, the radiologist needs to uh, report anything they see during their reading. So uh, in conclusion, uh, the, the manuals, the standards are helping to unify QC because it used to be whatever the manufacturer said and all the manufacturers were different. Uh, it's now focusing on these high yield tests so it gives you uh, important things instead of doing things repetitively that don't yield any, any uh, issues. And it's not time consuming. And of course, the physicists should be uh, involved in overseeing this. Uh, and this is required for ACR accreditation. So hopefully, uh, that was uh, informative. And uh, I think we have another panel later. Or should I take questions? Or? I think we'll wait for later and then we can get out of here earlier. <laughs> but if anybody has any questions, I'm around. Thank you.